Greetings again. I'm glad you're back with us, and I'm glad to be back with you. We've enjoyed five sessions going through these six essentials together, and we reached the last one this hour. And my prayer is that God will use not only this six essentials, but as you think about all six of them, these are a framework within which for us to age well to continually grow and see what it is that God has for us. So will you journey with me through this sixth, this sixth essential uh, in this series? Uh, our verse, uh, one of them, Psalm 139, we began with it in, verse, in the first essential. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days, and I have in parentheses, the aging days, that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. You know, God ordains every year we live, and He ordains it for a purpose as Moses. So teach me to number my days, to measure them, to see the value in them. What does God want for me in my latter years that He ordained? What is Jesus' mission for me in this season of my life? Remember, you're working on your mission statement. So all six of these essentials bring something to bear on what God has for me in these years. Again, I use Robert Browning's poem, Grow Old Along With Me, The Best Is Yet To Be, and I really believe that for this session. This session, the sixth essential, is for the end of our lives. That means the cessation of our lives, for when we won't be here anymore, our death. That is the best session of life, season of life, because we'll go to heaven. The last of life for which the first was made, our times are in his hands, who saith, the whole I plan, youth shows but half. God's just setting us up for these years. Trust God, see all, nor be afraid. Now, the sixth essential, very clearly, we will plan ahead for when we are gone. I quoted Moses, Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach me to number my days. The hourglass is winding down. As a fact, none of us ever know what our last day will be. Our last year, our last month, whatever. But it is winding down. We won't go on forever. The scriptures make that very clear. So that's the prayer of Moses. Ecclesiastes, by the way, Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books and Ecclesiastes has a lot to teach us about the value of life. You remember verses 1 and 2 in chapter two, uh, 3. There is an appointed time for everything. There is an appointed time for every event under heaven. Remember I talked at last session about being available, the fifth essential. There is an appointed time for every event under heaven. A time to give birth and a time to die. We'll talk about these essentials. How do our lives leave a legacy? What does it mean for us personally, spiritually, physically, family-wise, legal in the future? We'll roll through these. And we'll have a lot of discussion on these in the class. There's no way I can touch about everything in your workbook, but just some highlights here, and we'll drill down on these in our class together. So I'll look forward to doing that with you all as well. Okay, I begin with Jesus. You know, he is talking in John 14 about his death on the cross, and everybody is kind of upset about what's going to happen to Jesus. And he says in John 14, Do not let your heart be troubled. Death brings a fear factor. Are you afraid of death? Jesus was not. The, the one born in Bethlehem was born to die for your sin and my sin. My life has a birth and my life has a death marked on both sides. It's coming for me. So don't be troubled about it, Jesus said. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know where I'm going. You know, I referenced John Stuart Gilbert, uh, you know, in the last session. You know, his death at age 25. By the way, 
death comes at any age. It may come in the womb. It may come in infancy. It may come in childhood. It may come in adolescence. It may come in your youth years. It may come anytime, and God may allow me to live through a full life, as we'll see as well. But the big deal, don't be troubled. Think about it. Prepare for it. And by the way, Jesus is my example on there. He knew what he came to do. And I know that my life is going to have a terminus date on it. So do I live thinking about that, realizing I have limited resources, limited time? What is God teaching me? So follow me. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Paul says in this jail cell, maybe uh, weeks before his death, we don't know how long it was, but it was the last letter he wrote to Timothy, his disciple, whom he mentored and taught and poured his life. I have fought the good fight. By the way, it's not easy to live by these these six essentials. It's a fight to keep right priorities. The devil wants to dissuade us, get us off track at every point. I have fought the fight. I have finished the course. That's my little cyclist down there in the corner. That's him raising his hands as he crosses the finish line. I have finished the course. That's my death. And I've kept the faith all throughout my days. That's my mission. That's a goal that every younger person should have. I want to finish well. Every middle-aged person should have. Every older person should have a goal. I want to finish well. In the future, remember, we're always future-directed. There's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me. Think about the future again on that day. And not only to me, Paul, but to all of us who love his appearing. Why do we live? We live for the appearing of Jesus wanting to be with him. Now, let me back off for a second. There are three questions every aging person must address. Watch this. Number one, what will I do when I stop working or stop working for money? I should have added that. That's what I mean. When you hit retirement or stop working for money, how are you going to think? What's going on in your life? Number two, what will I do when my health begins to decline? That may be a slow process. It may be a a faster process. But are you thinking ahead? And that's one of the purposes of this six essentials. People in their 50s need to start thinking about this. What do you do in retirement? People in your 60s, 70s, what do you do when you are retired? And what will you do when your health begins to decline? And three, what will I do when I face my death? Those three questions are critical questions that every aging person ought to think about. I love this quote by Frederick Beekner. William Hazlitt wrote that no young person, no young man believes that he will ever die. And the truth of the matter is, I think, that in some measure it's true for all of us. Intellectual, we all know that we will die, but we do not really know it in the sense that the knowledge becomes part of us. How back are you facing your death? We do not really know it in the sense of living as though it were true. On the contrary, we tend to live as though our lives would go on forever. We spend our lives like drunken sailors, not realizing what's coming in our lives. I think of Psalm 90. I I love Moses' reflections on aging in Psalm 90. He says this, For all of our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or due to strength, maybe 80. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. God, I want to be a good student of the life you've given me. And I want to trust you and grow into this season of my life. Now, I mentioned Ecclesiastes. I want to, uh, I'll, I'll just highlight some phrases here. Ecclesiastes 12 is the most graphic description of the end of life in the scriptures that I know of. Now, follow this. Uh, The writer of Ecclesiastes uh, has this at the beginning of chapter 12. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. You know, anything before old age 
Every person before old age needs to be thinking about this. Before the evil days, and he's simply talking that evil and morality, but I don't want these days. They're going to be hard days, maybe. The years draw by when you say, I don't want to go this way. Watch this. Uh, before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened. The clouds return after rain. The watchmen of the house tremble. I think it's your eyes. Mighty men stoop. You lose your strength. The teeth, I, grinding ones stand idle because they, we got good dentists today, but you know, older people have a, tendency, have a tendency to lose their teeth. Those who look through windows grow dim. The doors in the street are shut. Older people generally, many of us wear hearing aids. One will rise at the sound of the bird and the daughters will sing softly. Anything wakes you as you age. Talk to people about how they sleep in their aging years. Men are afraid of high places and terrors on the road. You know, I have a steeped roof on the house where Vicki and I live, and I've lived there for 31 years. And the first year that we moved there, I was 31 years younger than I am today. And I would climb across the edge of the roof, just hand over hand, way up high, putting on Christmas lights. You know, somewhere in my 60s, I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm afraid of high places. What if I, they say older people should stay off ladders? I'm afraid of falling. The grasshopper drags himself along. The caper berry is ineffective. Man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. So remember, remember God before the silver cord is broken, the golden bowl is crushed, the pitcher by the well is shattered, and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. I don't know how many memorial services or graveside services I've done where I've quoted those words. We return to the dust as it was. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Well, is that all there is? No, not from an eternal perspective. But if you go through life without understanding God's purpose in it all, it comes up empty. Those are the words of the preacher in Ecclesiastes 12. Now you come to the New Testament. I'm going to jump. I may use so many passages on this. I'm going to jump to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. By the way, the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 is on the resurrection. It's on the transition between death and the resurrection. I went to a memorial service years ago, and one of the things they did at that memorial service, they read the entire 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians because it's all on the presence of God after death. Watch this. I'll, I'll just quote part of this to the end. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Now follow this for a minute. The scriptures clearly teach that I can't go to heaven in this body. This body has to die. If I, and even in the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, I will be changed in the air to an immortal body. This body is of this earth. It has to die. So I want to say, if you want to go to heaven, you have to go through death. Or the Lord comes back, they're, they're my only two choices. So I need to face my death. I need to prepare for it. I need to think about it. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we'll be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. Not perishable. We'll be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. Which is why he asked, O death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? I will die. You will die, except that the Lord comes back. But the sting is gone. I understand what's happening. I understand how God created life. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, in the days as you think about your death or in your latter years, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what we ought to be about it every year in life particularly the aging season, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Incredible verses. Thinking about our death and the purpose God has for us in these aging years. Now, I mentioned uh, Joseph. 
uh, I mean, here is his philosophy about dying. He faced his death. He made uh, plans for his body, by the way. I mentioned this earlier. He was embalmed, and 432 years later, they carried his body through all 40 years in the desert, and he was buried in Shechem. But he says, I, here's, here's what we all ought to think when it comes to our death. I'm about to die. So have I made my plans? Have you made your plans? Do you know what you're going to say to your kids? Do you know what you're going to say to your grandkids? Is your story etched in their ears and in their hearts? Because once you die, they won't have your voice in their lives anymore. Yes, Hebrews 1, Hebrews 11 says, even though he's dead, Abel still speaks. My dad, who's been gone a long time, he died when I was a senior in college. I still hear his voice, but I won't hear his voice physically. I'm about to die, my dad told me. I was with him just a bit before he died. I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you. And he lived to be 110. So what's your message? What's my message going to be when it comes to my death? Now, I want to explore these issues very briefly. Each of our lives is a legacy. I think it's in uh, 1 Kings 22, King Jehoram died. <laughs> he was a terrible king, and I could talk about that for a long time. You don't want to die like Jehoram did. It's at the end of chapter 22, I think it says, he died with no one's regret. Now, how hard, horrible do you have to live to die with no one's regret? They were just glad he died and got out of the way. He was a miserable king, and he was, in fact. Read his story. So what kind of legacy am I going to leave? Now, we could go through each one of these in a session all by itself, but I want to hit some highlights for you. So go with me. Values. What are your values as an aging person? What values have been important to you? And how will you pass them on? For example, if you had to sit down, what are the 10 best or the three best values you have, you and your spouse have, or you and your marriage have, if you're both still living, your marriage, what made your marriage work? Are you talking about that with your grown kids as they grow their own marriages? As your grandkids are in marriage or your great-grandkids. There's a man in a group that I lead. He has uh, 19 great-grandchildren in his family. What did your parents teach you? What are the values you bring from the home in which you grew up in? What did you teach your kids? What were the values you wanted your kids to really know and develop? And are you continuing that process in their lives now? Here's a good question. What do you want your adult kids to teach your grandkids? Have you ever had a conversation with your grown kids saying, you know, well, what is your plan to teach your kids? What are the things that are important to you in all of life, in money, in government, in civics, in culture, in media, whatever it is, what are, in, in your own life, integrity? Do you have a sense of values in your life that you're communicating? What would have Joseph said to his two sons? What would have he said to his grandkids? Let me ask you a second question. Are your stories written down? Now, one of the things about aging, I, I just think you forget more things than you ever know. And you ever... So what's the story of your life? I think about it with my own life. Have I written down the story of my life for my kids? For my grandkids, you know, someday I won't be here and they won't be able to ask, Papa, what was life like back then? Or what did you do when you went through this or that? Well, if I don't have it written down, how are they going to know? You know, we live in today a culture of immediacy, I might say. <laughs> you know, I want this now. We forget the past. You know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn has a great phrase, Dwell in the past, you lose one eye. Forget the past and you lose both eyes. Do you know your history? Are you giving it to your kids? Where have you lived? How has God led in your life? The fifth essential we talked about, you know, being available for God as he leads. I love this one. Are your kids learning from your failures? Have you talked about your failures to your adult kids? 
Uh, I made a mistake here. Don't make the same mistake I had. Are you talking about those things with generations to come? What about the people in your life? Your immediate family lineage, you know, Ancestry.com. Figure out your life. Extended family. Who are the people who influenced you in your life? I think one of the reasons I'm, I'm in this ministry of encouraging older people, older people have marked my life. I have a couple sermons that I have given on older people who have changed my life. It's really important. Blessing your kids. Who are the people who have influenced you in life most? If you had to list five people who have influenced you, who are they and why? It's a great discussion starter for a small group. Converse about the aging people God has used in your life. Uh, legal documents. Uh, have you taken care of the legal documents that relate to the end of life, your life, one's life? Uh, wills, trust. You know, a greater percentage of people die without wills than die with them today. Even Christians. I think this is a ministry a church ought to have. They could put a, a seminar on and legal issues, the durable powers of attorney, medical, living will, directives. How many people don't do this with their life? DNRs, passwords, details related to your computer, bank, investment details, all associated with any or all the above. And by the way, as you think about your will, are your kingdom mindset, is your kingdom mindset communicated clearly to your adult kids and the legacy of your life? By the way, in this generation, the generation preceding me, the greatest transition of wealth ever in any given country will happen in the United States of America in the next 30 to 40 years. What's going to happen to that wealth as the aging people leave this world? Uh, let me be very practical on another area. What about funeral concerns? Are your advanced funeral decisions or directives completed? Uh, do you have burial details nailed down in your life? What, what do you want done with your body? You want a traditional burial, cre cremation, a body donation? Are you pre-planning your funeral directives? Have you paid for it? Uh, as a pastor, I've read it this so many times where people have done nothing to prepare for their, their end. And so their kids or their spouse have to put together, how do we honor dad, mom, or whoever? Are you pre-planning uh, memorial service details? Who's left to define all that? Selection of funeral products. Make all these in advance. Don't saddle your children with these details. Remember, Joseph did that in Genesis 50. He had plans for his embalming, plans for his burial, plans for everything. You and I would do very well to cover all of those issues in our own lives in thinking about our death. You should have conversations with your pastor, decisions with your spouse and your family about the end, conversations with your pastor, memorial service details, etc. I envision older people having these conversations with their adult kids, with their grandkids, as God gives us years. Lots of questions going back and forth. Spiritual, how will you pass on your spiritual story? All of these issues, how has God led you, your spiritual life, milestones, Remember Joshua elected all those milestones. What are the milestones in your life? People is used, et cetera, et cetera. We can work through those, and I hope you will. But now the second part of this last essential is thinking about heaven. You know, that's where we're going, aren't we? Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. And when I do, I'm going to come back and receive you to myself. Do you remember Psalm 71? Uh, I declare your wondrous deeds. How many conversations should we as aging people be having amongst ourselves about heaven? That's where we're going, aren't we? I, I love it. Randy Alcorn has written several books. Lots of authors have written on this. We should read these as we age. We should think of the scriptures as we age, preparing ourselves for eternity in heaven. Yes, our eternal life has started now, but we will live for the rest of eternity on the other side of life in heaven and with Jesus. 
Now, I want to give you just a few scriptures to think about. This is Paul, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I love this verse. But just that is written, things which the eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which not have entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Now, watch this for a minute. Use your imagination. Everything you've seen, the best things you've ever seen, the best pictures you've ever seen, the most beautiful things you have ever seen or imagined, everything you've ever heard, the best symphony you've ever heard, the best music you've ever heard. This, this is not nearly what you could imagine heaven will be like. You know, heaven will be, uh, be beyond our wildest dreams, our wildest imagination. We have never seen anything like it. We have never heard anything like it. We've never experienced anything like that. It'll be umpteen thousand times more significant than anything we have ever experienced in this life. Jesus is the only one who has been there. And he came to show us what living with him and living with his Father and dwelt by the Spirit is all about. I love this little line by C.S. Lewis. Departures or death are all alike. It is the landfall that crowns the voyage. Think about that for a minute. Where I'm going is far better than anything I've ever experienced in my life. It's better than my marriage, better than my family, better than my life, better than the best age you have ever lived. Can you dream about what God has for you and me in heaven? It'll be amazing. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. But we know that when He appears, when He comes for us, or when we enter into His presence through death, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. Isn't it the best news about heaven? We'll see Jesus face to face. Isn't the best news about heaven? We'll understand all that has happened in our lives from His perspective. We'll understand the scriptures. We'll understand biblical history. We'll understand how He has woven everything into our lives, even our tragic mistakes, our failures, whatever they are. We will see Him for as He is. I can't wait. Can you? And then I want to quote from Revelation 21, the first four verses, uh, the 22, 21 and 22 in Revelation. But just follow me in these first four verses. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. By the way, I love to sail. There's no sea. It didn't say there's no water, but there's no sea. My only sense about that, there's something dark about the sea. You can drown in it. You can go down in it. There are monsters, big fish in the deep, but there's no sea in heaven. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He will dwell among them. God will dwell with us in heaven not just Jesus, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them, and He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there'll be no longer any death, no more memorial service, no more funerals, no more death. I love it. There will be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Is that not amazing? You know, do you, when's the last time you've been in a conversation with an older person about heaven? By the way, if you're a younger person, I would encourage you to be with older people when they die, if you can. Be with your mom and dad. Be with older people in the church. Go sit with them in an assisted living facility when you can and listen to them, listen to their stories and encourage them in this season of life. So brainstorm. Here's our chart. Death and heaven. What do they mean to you? Think about them out loud. Brainstorm as a group. Brainstorm in our class. We'll do that when we're together. And then after you do that, what are the barriers? What keeps us? Why don't people prepare? Ernest Becker wrote a a Pulitzer Prize winner in 1961 entitled The Denial of Death. We deny it as a people. We don't want to face it. Why? 
What are the barriers? The scriptures talk openly about it. All the saints died and they went to heaven to be with the Lord. And how does Satan work to keep us from planning ahead for our death? Important questions. The sixth essential. These are the six. Now let me review them quickly. We grow in all of these areas, by the way. We want to connect. We, we want relationships. We want to love, deeply love. We want to invest. We want to be available. And yes, we want to plan ahead for when our end comes. It makes all the difference in the world. So now, questions you think about against the backdrop of all these six essentials. In what direction is God leading me to invest my time, talent, and treasure? My joys. What do I love to do? Why can't I do it more now in my aging? Your gifts, your experiences, who do you share them with? What are the opportunities in my life right now? Learn about yourself as you age. Increase your self-awareness in all areas of life. And what is my mission in life? What is your mission? Uh, Maybe big, maybe small. I came across this poem, and I want to close with this and one more slide. What is your mission that you're figuring out? Poem goes like this. Father, where shall I work today? And my love flowed warm and free. Then he pointed out a tiny spot and said, tend that for me. I answered quickly, oh no, not that. Why no one would ever see, no matter how well my work was done, not that little place for me. And the word that he spoke was not stern, He answered me tenderly, Ah, little one, search that heart of thine. Art thou working for them or me? Nazareth was a little place, and so was Galilee. You know, I don't know where your spot is in this church, in your community, in your family. Let let me tell you, you and I have a heart that wants to serve God. And He will lead us through all the things that happen in life. So follow Him. Think about your life. Develop your mission and knock on doors and He will direct your paths. Remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? He'll make the path straight. So I bring these six essentials to a close. What is my mission? You know, as a pastor, I love praying the benedictions at the end of a service. And this was a benediction I would pray more frequently than anything else, including even number six, the prayer of Aaron that Moses prayed. But I love the writer of Hebrews as he closed the book of Hebrews with this blessing. And I want to pray it for you and bless you as we finished this sixth and all six essentials. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do His will, working in us that which is pleasing to Him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever and ever. May God bless you in this journey of living for Christ and finishing well. Amen.